Ask yourself the question, where did the sound of the phone come from? But only refer to your direct experience for the answer. Did the sound of the phone originate outside mind? and then appear as a perception in the mind. When we heard the sound of the phone, it was obviously a perception in the mind. Just recall the sound. That sound, the, the recall of the sound, obviously takes place in mind. The original experience of the sound took place in exactly the same place that the recall of the sound took place in. The difference is that we believe that the original sound originated outside mind, but was experienced inside mind. Whereas the memory of the sound just takes place in mind. And try to find that place in your experience just outside mind from which we believe the sound originated. in order to believe that the sound originates outside mind. We must, whether we realize it or not, believe that mind exists inside the body. If the mind exists inside the body, then there is some justification for believing that the sound originated outside mind, which means outside the body. But go to your experience of the body now. Keep your eyes closed to begin with.
your body is a cluster of sensations and perceptions. It is the experience of sensing and perceiving. Do not sensing and perceiving take place in mind. Sensing and perceiving take place in mind and are made of mind. see how our belief that the mind exists in the body conditions our interpretation of the world. If the mind exists in the body, then everything outside the mind, that is outside the body, must be something other than the mind. And matter is the name that our culture gives to this substance that supposedly exists outside mind. From this point of view, the world has existed much longer than we have. The world made out of matter was here first. The body appeared in the world made out of the stuff that the world is supposedly made of, that is matter. The brain developed in the body, made out of matter, and at some point gave rise to this substance called mind. This is the world view that almost everybody, whether they know it or not, subscribes to you. Matter is the ultimate nature of reality, the stuff out of which the universe is made. And mind is derived from it. And thus we all 
believe and feel what I essentially am is a mind in a body moving around in a world from the point of view of this mind in the body or self in the body time and space are the container in which all experience appears time and space is as it were the background of the universe in which everything including our own bodies and minds exist this point of view might be justifiable if it wasn't for something extraordinary that happens every night the body and the world vanish from experience but mind continues in other words when we say I fall asleep the mind obviously doesn't fall asleep all that happens is that the body and the world disappear from the mind and a new body and a new world appear in the same mind we call it the dream the dream to world seems to be known or seen from the perspective of the character in the dream that we seem to have become but the entire dreamed world with all the dreamed characters including the dreamed character that we seem to have become all takes place in the same mind that our waking state experience takes place in And then something even more extraordinary happens. The dreamed world and the character that we seem to have become in the dream also vanish out of the mind, leaving mind empty. and then a new dreamed world appears and then a new waking state world appears it all takes place in mind This is why the British physicist in the earlier, early 20th century, James Jeans, said, 
it seems that the universe is a great thought, not a great machine. Just consider the possibility that everything you experience is mind. Thinking, imagining, feeling, sensing, seeing, hearing, tasting. It's not so hard to consider this possibility because it is actually in line with our experience. What should be much more difficult to imagine is that our experience is made out of something other than mind, such as matter. Because nobody has ever found or experienced that stuff. Could it be that all experience is a coloring of mind? Just like all movies are a coloring of the screen. Test out this possibility in your experience. See if in your experience you can find anything other than the content of mind. If I am a mind in a body, then I am moving around in time and space. That is the conventional point of view. the character 
in the movie believes that the screen exists inside its own body, then the character will feel I move around in time and space. But ask yourself the question, if it is my experience that the body and the world appear in mind, does mind itself ever go anywhere? say mind itself, I mean consciousness, the essential, irreducible, uncolored essence of mind, the screen out of which the movie is made. Does the screen ever go anywhere in a movie? Do you, consciousness, ever go anywhere? Do you travel through time and space? Isn't it extraordinary that all experience takes place now and here? Is it possible that now is not a moment in time and that here is not a place in space? If now were a moment in time, it would have a certain duration and we would feel that it moves slowly along this line of time. And just ask yourself the question, how long does now last? And how fast is now moving through time? And what is the difference between this now and this now? Are you absolutely sure that now 
is in time. In order to be sure of that, we would have to experience this stuff called time. Try to experience time. Try to experience, for instance, the past. Just leave the now for a few moments and go into the past, the place where time supposedly exists. Maybe just go back a, a few seconds into the past. Don't worry, the now will still be here when you get back. <laughs> What was it like there in the past? <laughs> Can anybody tell us about it? Isn't it strange that our culture, our world culture is founded on a few very basic presumptions. Time being one of them. And yet, strangely, when we look for it, we never find it. Is that just because we don't look hard enough? Uh, it, will we find it one day? Uh, is it possible that this fundamental presumption might not be true. Could it be that experience doesn't take place in time? But rather that it takes place in consciousness. Could it be that the medium in which experience takes place is consciousness? not time. Could it be that time is what consciousness looks like when viewed from the limited perspective of the finite mind? Just like when the character in the movie looks around herself at the landscape, 
she sees space. Space is what the screen looks like from her limited point of view. The two-dimensional screen looks like three-dimensional space from the point of view of the character in the movie. Could it be that infinite, dimensionless consciousness itself assumes the form of the finite mind and from the point of view of the finite mind appears to itself as time and space. In other words, could it be that time and space are what infinite, dimensionless consciousness look like from the point of view of the finite mind? this is true, then the now from the point of view of the finite mind is like a little window onto eternity. The now is the access that the finite mind has to eternity. By eternity, I mean dimensionless consciousness. experience is a movement of mind or a coloring of mind. And the essential nature of mind is pure consciousness, knowing. From the point of view of consciousness, it is always now, always the same now. That now is not going anywhere. It is not moving. It 
it is eternity. The now is not going anywhere. It hasn't come from somewhere. This now is the only now there is. Now is another name for consciousness, the irreducible, indestructible, essential nature of mind. It never goes anywhere. It never does anything. All experience is a, a coloring of that a movement of that. Birth and death are colorings of its own eternal being. It doesn't pass through birth and death any more than a screen passes through the beginning or the end of a movie. The beginning of a movie, the end of the movie, and all the time and space that takes place in the movie is simply a coloring of the transparent empty screen. The screen doesn't exist during the time in which the movie seems to take place. When the characters in the movie travel through space the screen doesn't go anywhere. You, I, consciousness, are not traveling through time and space. We haven't come from somewhere. We are not going anywhere. We were not born. We are not evolving. We're not growing old. We're not destined for death and non-existence or rebirth. I, consciousness, am still in the same pristine, ageless condition that I am always in. I, consciousness, knows nothing of time. I, consciousness, never travel through space. I know nothing of space. Space is what my infinite dimensionless being looks like from the point of view of the finite mind. It is I, 
consciousness that assumes the form of the finite mind and appears to myself as space. finite mind is a modulation of my infinite being. The finite mind is a coloring of myself, I consciousness. It is I, consciousness, that freely assumes the form of the finite mind. And appears to myself as the world. But I, consciousness, never cease to be myself. I never become something other than myself. The entire activity of mind takes place in me. It is made of me. limited mind is made out of me, but I am not made out of it. The limitations of the mind are made out of me, but I do not share its limitations. The limited movie is made out of the unlimited screen. But the unlimited screen is not limited by the movie. I, infinite consciousness, am all there is to experience. give birth to the world inside myself and seem to become a self in the world from whose point of view that world is seen. In other words, in order to bring the world into existence, I have to divide myself in two. I become a separate subject of experience in order to know a separate object. Just like when Mary falls asleep in garrison, 
she dreams that she is Jane on the streets of London. I thought it was time to introduce Mary and Jane for those of you that <laughs> for those of you that don't know her. She comes on all of these retreats. But Mary is always sleeping at the back of the room. As soon as satsang begins, she falls asleep. And she dreams that she's Jane in London, or Claire in Paris, or Keiko in Tokyo. So Mary is bored of satsang in garrison. She thinks, how can I get out of here? Oh yeah, I want to go to London. She closes her eyes, she falls asleep. And she wakes up as Jane on the streets of London. That is the only way that Mary in garrison can know the streets of London. She has to fall asleep to her own mind. She has to cease knowing her own mind as it is. She has to limit her own mind. And become Jane on the streets of London. Now Jane on the streets of London thinks that she sees the streets of London with her mind which is located just behind her eyes. When she closes her eyes, London disappears. She opens them again, London reappears. So she reasonably concludes that her mind lives in her head just behind her eyes. When Jane is sitting on a train from London to Manchester and the phone goes off, she thinks the sound of the phone originated in the space outside my mind. But what is Jane's mind? Where is it located? Where is the knowing? with which Jane knows her experience located? Is it located inside Jane's body? No, it is Mary's sleeping mind in garrison. From Jane's point of view, the streets of London take place outside her mind. But Jane doesn't really have her own mind. Her own mind is just a temporary limitation superimposed on Mary's mind. Mary's mind is infinite. It has freely given up the knowing of its own infinite being in order to assume the form of Mary's limited mind. It is from the perspective of Mary's limited mind. Sorry from the perspective of Jane has, <laughs> Mary has given up the knowing of her own infinite being in order to assume the form of Jane's finite mind. It is through Jane's finite mind that Mary knows the streets of London. Jane doesn't have her own mind. Her own mind is just a limitation on Mary's infinite mind. It is not a mistake. Mary has freely overlooked the knowing of her own infinite being in order to assume the temporary form of Jane's mind. What is the name that Jane gives to her mind? What does Jane call herself? I. From Jane's point of view, I seems to live inside her head. But 
what happens when Jane takes her mind and directs itself towards I, towards the essence of her mind. In other words, what, is, what happens when Jane really tries to find out what her mind is? What happens when Jane asks herself the question, I want to know the nature of my mind. It seems to be limited. It seems to live inside my body. When Jane's mind asks itself the question, what is my essential nature? Jane's mind begins to trace its way back to its source. And at some point recognizes, I am Mary. Jane was just a temporary limitation superimposed on Mary's infinite mind. Our finite minds, each of our finite minds is like that. A temporary limitation superimposed on infinite consciousness. Not superimposed from the outside. There is nothing outside infinite consciousness that could superimpose anything upon it. It is infinite consciousness itself that freely assumes the form of each of our minds. It is like Mary simultaneously dreaming she is Jane in London, Claire in Paris, Keiko in Tokyo. Infinite consciousness simultaneously dreams each of our finite minds into existence from the point of view of each of our finite minds. Each of our minds is separate and located inside our bodies. But if each of us traces our mind back to its source, if each of our minds asks the question, what am I really? As the mind, as each finite mind traces its way back, it is gradually divested of all its self-assumed limitations and stands revealed as the same infinite consciousness. Each of our minds is precipitated in the same field of infinite consciousness. And love is the experience of our shared consciousness. That is the common way of knowing that the essential nature of what we all are is one. It is the experience of love. So I'm not talking about some extraordinary mystical experience that a few people are graced to have. I'm talking about something that is known by everyone, but overlooked due to the absurd interpretation of experience that our culture gives to us when we are young. Love is the experience of our shared being. The recognition that each of our minds is precipitated within the same infinite field. What is it that all apparently finite minds or separate selves long for above all else or value above all else? Is it not love? Is 
Do not all separate selves desire love above all else? The desire for love is simply the desire to be divested of our separateness. When consciousness assumes the form of the finite mind for the sake of manifestation, it imposes a limit on itself. Mary has to give up or sacrifice or forget the knowing of her own infinite being in order to appear as Jane on the streets of London. Consciousness sacrifices itself by becoming a separate self and in doing so it overlooks the knowing of its own infinite being. Attention is set up in the finite mind as a result of this forgetting. And all the desires that anybody ever has is simply the desire to be released of this self-contraction, this tension. Any desire that any of us have ever had for an object, a relationship, a substance, an activity, is really the single desire that the separate hand self has to be relieved of this tension or contraction, to be relieved of the limitations, to be relieved of the feeling of separation. In other words, all our desires are simply infinite consciousness drawing the mind, attracting the mind back to itself. The separate self feels, I am doing the desiring. It's not. The separate self does nothing. There is no separate self. The separate self is simply an imaginary limit superimposed on consciousness, self-assumed by consciousness. There is no real separate self. Jane does not have her own mind. Her own mind is just a temporary limitation of Mary's infinite mind, the only mind there truly is. The desire Jane feels on the streets of, happy, of London for happiness are simply the desire to be relieved of that limitation and to go back to Mary's peaceful mind. So the Separate self feels, I am doing the desiring. No, it is consciousness that is attracting the separate self back to itself. The, the devotee feels, I am loving God. No, it is God that is loving the devotee. That is why the Italian monk said, Lord, thou art the love with which I love thee. He suddenly realized, I thought I was loving you. But the very love with which I love you, the very love with which I am devoted to you, is your love for me.
people often ask me, why don't you do silent retreats? And one of the reasons is that I value friendship too highly. Friendship is an expression of love. That is, friendship is an expression of our shared being. talking together in the dining room. I just see uh, all of us expressing our shared being through friendship and conversation. I would never want to impose silence on that. Coming back to the now, use time for practical purposes, but abandon psychological time. unless you need to think of time for practical purposes. Just stop thinking about it. Stop imagining that it exists. Why? Simply because you have never experienced it. Ask yourself the question, What happens to my problems if there is no psychological time? Could you worry with, about anything without the presumption of time? Could you be sick without the presumption of time? Could you be aging or destined for death without the presumption of time? So you see, this is nothing to do with disciplining your mind and trying to live in the now or anything like that. That would just be more mind. The 
This is about understanding. If time is truly seen to be non-existent, then living in the now is an inevitable consequence of that understanding. It is not the result of effort or discipline. And therefore it doesn't need to be maintained by effort or discipline. It is just an inevitable, totally relaxed, effortless consequence of understanding. Experiential understanding. When I say experiential understanding, we have to go to the facts of our experience. To see that all experience is mind and consciousness is the nature of mind. And that consciousness never goes anywhere. It hasn't come from somewhere. It's not destined for anywhere. It wasn't born. It's not aging. It's not going to die. Thank you.